Okay, here's my weak point, the skills practice. And it says, preference list ballot, and then it gives you three. The, the, the um, correct answer is B. You rank the candidates. They don't just look at first place and throw it away. They, they actually look at the ranking, and then they give points, assign points, and the rankings actually take into consideration. So you actually care about who got second, who got third, not that you just take first. Okay, number two, to say a voting system treats all its voters equally means that all votes cast count the same, okay? Like the millionaire's votes cost the same as, or um, cast count is what that should say. Count the same. Count the same, okay? All votes cast count the same. That means the millionaire's vote counts just as much as the bum's vote, kind of. Okay, number three, to say that a voting system for two candidates treats both candidates equally means that B, if all voters reverse their ballots and just complete reversal, okay, like the guy you pick last goes up to first, all voters do this, then everything's going to be reversed when they do that. It's going to be letter B, okay, both candidates are equal. All voters reverse their ballots, the election outcome changes. Okay, here's the monotone. Here's what that means. Um, uh, it's called mono, monotonicity, I think. But it says a two-candidate voting system is monotone if an election's held, there's a winner. If it's held again and one single voter, just one, changes his vote from the loser to the winner, and everyone else vote stays the same. The same person's still going to win. That means when Trump beat Hillary, let's say one Hillary voter goes back and says, oh, I want to redo that. Let me vote for Trump. Well, then Trump's obviously going to still win. Okay? It's called monotone. Okay, C, May's theorem. May's theorem treats both candidates equally. That's one thing. Every vote has to be equal, and it's got to be monotone. Those are the three conditions. Both candidates are treats both candidates the same. Every vote's equal, and it's monotone. Meaning, if a revote's cast again, monotone. I'm going to keep reemphasizing that. If a revote is cast, winner moves up higher on one single ballot. The same person's still going to win. Okay, number six, the winner with Condorcet's method is a candidate who, now on number nine, that was the first problem we did. The winner's able to defeat every other candidate in a one-on-one -on -one runoff. So if you remember that problem number nine we did on the math part, okay, it's the very first problem, look at your notes. We took a candidate, paired him off against everybody else, and when he beat the other two, because there was only three, I think, when he beat the other two, I knew that he was a winner because he was able to defeat them one on one. That's what Condorcet's method is. Okay, number seven. Which of the following does not satisfy two of the conditions of May's theorem? Okay, all these are examples that um, don't satisfy two of the conditions. Okay. It's none of the above, actually, okay? Because the dictatorship only violates, because it wants ones that are going to violate two of them, okay? The answer is D, none of the above. Because if you go back here in your text, it says, example, condition one is not satisfied for a dictatorship, okay? All votes aren't treated equally because the only one that matters is the dictator, Okay. Imposed rule doesn't satisfy condition two. Condition two is like when you have a chosen one candidate, no matter what happens in the election, he's going to win. Okay, That's condition two because you're not treating the candidates equally. The votes are treated equally. They're all equally worthless. Okay, It's also monotone because no matter what you do, if you reverse your vote for the winner, he's still going to win regardless of what you did. Okay. 
then condition three is not satisfied by minority rule. Minority rule is when the one with the least votes wins. Okay, the ones with the least votes wins. So out of all those, all of those violate one of the three rules, but not more than one. I don't like that crap The mirrors the theorem. It just is kind of meaningless. Okay, when I did the Condorcet's method, here's the flaw in that. Sometimes there's a voting paradox because sometimes there is no winner. Because if I have the Packers beat – it's like football teams. If you have the Packers beat the Cowboys and then we pair the Cowboys against the Patriots and the Cowboys win and then I do Patriots-Packers and the Patriots win, you can tell by that there's going to be no winner because they all beat each other. So that's what the paradox is. The flaw in the method is that sometimes there is no winner. Okay, nine. Condorcet's voting paradox refers to C, just like eight and nine are pretty much the same question. Sometimes you're not going to have a winner when you face them one to one like that, because sometimes who beat? It's like the Redskins beat the Cowboys, the Cowboys beat the Eagles, and the Redskins beat Cowboys, Cowboys beat Eagles, and when the Eagles play the Redskins, the um, Eagles might win. Okay, so they all beat each other. Okay, number 10, plurality voting. The winner is the candidate who is determined. Remember, we did those on the math problems. It's a, the winner is determined by who gets the most first place votes. That's all that matters. George Bush's defeat of Al Gore in the state of Florida in 2000 presidential election shows that letter A is the right answer. Okay, the answer is letter A because here's why. Had it just been Gore versus Bush one-on-one, -on -one, Gore would have won in Florida because Florida is what decided it. Had it just been more, more ballots preferred Gore to Bush, but Bush had more first place. He won the plurality. Okay, So when you match Gore-Bush one-on-one, -on -one, Gore wins. But because presidential elections in states are measured on plurality, they just look at first place and nothing else. Okay, Gore would have won. Unfortunately for Gore, Ralph Nader stole first place votes from Gore because he's kind of a Democrat liberal guy too. So then more ballots favored Gore over Bush in Florida, but Bush had more first place votes. Okay, so that's why it's A. Okay, number 12. With the board account, the election winner is the candidate who... It's a candidate with the most points. It's similar to how a track meet is scored. Five points for first, three for second, two for third, one for fourth. Now, the, the paradox there is it's impossible a team might not win a single event, but if they rack enough second-place finishes, they can finish with more points than any other team. You see that at track mates all the time. If you don't have like a dominant team, but you have a lot of pretty good guys, you can still win lots of track meets because you get a lot of second- and third-place finishes. Okay, 13. Instead of assigning points and doing arithmetic, the border score of a candidate can be found by, it's like these little boxes here. I don't really understand this one. The answer is A. I know it is. This one here, it's on page uh, 294. They talk about these little boxes. I find that more confusing than just doing it the way we did, but that's kind of what it means. Okay, 13. Scanning the ballots and counting the number of occurrences of a candidate below that one. Okay, because they counted them and they made all these little boxes and just counted the occurrence. Yeah, I don't, I don't really understand it. Okay, number 14, independence of irrelevant alternatives says that a non-winner can never switch to being a winner unless at least one voter changes his ballot or her ballot in a way that changes the order in which he had the winner and non-winner, okay? Unless at least one voter changes his, his or her ballot in an order in which he had the winner and the non-winner, okay? So the winner and the non-winner. 
in order for that result to change, you have to flip the winner and the non-winner. You can't keep the winner ahead and have it change. Okay, board account fails to satisfy that method, and here's why, page 295. Answers letter C, too, by the way, on that one. Okay, so they run this election with the board account, okay? That's a voter, that's a voter, that's a voter, and then the result, A went A6, B5, C is 4. However, this one voter went, and what he did, this last voter, and CBA, so A is a winner with the board account, CBA, okay? And what he did is he flipped BCA, okay? A, it had no impact on A, okay? A is not impacted by this. He's left in the same place he was in. But because they flop B and C, B is now the winner because now he garnered some first place votes. And the reason why that violates that rule, the, in, the independence of irrelevant alternatives, is because A should not lose that because he had nothing, the recast had nothing to do with him. Okay? It was totally irrelevant. He's not part of that. Okay? They flip those two, and then we have a new winner. And that's a violation of the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Okay, The non-winner can never switch to being a winner unless at least one voter changes his ballot in a way that favors the non-winner over the previous winner. Well, again, A, again, C or B didn't jump A. I mean, A's already down there. Okay, But then when they switch those two... For it to actually satisfy the independence of irrelevant alternatives, then in one of these other voters, you would have to have B actually jump over A, okay? And none of no, he never jumped over him, okay? He was already ahead of him on that one. He never jumped him in any of the ones that were any of the previous ballots, okay? That's kind of what that means. So board account fails to satisfy C, as you just saw there. There was a change that had nothing to do, irrelevant means nothing to do with the winner, and yet he ended up not winning when, they, when that one voter changed his ballot. Okay, number 16, sequential pairwise voting is a voting system. We did quite a lot with sequential pairwise voting. It is a competition between two candidates. Whoever wins goes on to face a third candidate. Sequential pairwise voting fails to satisfy. It fails to satisfy something what's called the Pareto condition. Okay, Here's what that means. Everyone votes Rogers over Romo for MVP. Everybody, everybody on their ballot. I mean, there's other guys involved like Cam Newton or Brady or somebody. Everybody has Rodgers over Romo. But Romo somehow ends up winning the MVP. Because maybe, say, Rodgers faced Cam Newton and Newton wins. And then some people thought Romo was better than Newton. But Rodgers and Romo never faced off. Rodgers would have won because everybody would have favored him. Okay, if it was just one on one, but when you throw other candidates in there, there are times where it's possible, especially with sequential pairing. Okay, because if Rogers and Newton open off the sequential pairing, if that's your opening round, Newton wins. Okay, and Rogers, and then Newton loses to Romo. Well, Rogers is always going to beat Romo, so be, having Romo be the winner is not. It doesn't satisfy the Pareto condition, meaning if there's one candidate who always loses to another candidate, there's no way he can win. Sometimes in sequential pairing, that happens. Okay, It's kind of like March Madness. Let's say like Kansas. 
let's say like Duke has no shot to beat Kansas, but somebody else knocks out Kansas and then Duke beats them. Well, that's not then that's a violation of the Pareto condition is what that's called. Okay, number 18. Both the hair system and the plurality runoff method are, are defective. Okay. Sequential, they're defective because someone may be eliminated this early, early. Okay. Remember the hair system is where you eliminate kind of your lowest score. Because someone may be eliminated early despite being able to beat the person that winds up the winner at the end. Okay, and then the last one you had to do, number 19, Arrow's Theorem. It says that with three or more candidates in a number of orders, there's no voting system that always produces a winner, satisfies the Pareto condition, and independence of irrelevant alternatives, and is not a dictatorship. Basically means it's, it's perfect to satisfy every condition. Okay, it's Arrow's Theorem basically says... Some voting system works better in other situations, but there is no voting system that is completely perfect. Okay, then you had to do one through four, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just, number four, I had no idea. No idea. I would wing that one. Okay, in a few sentences, explain why minority rule satisfies conditions one and two, but not three. Condition one, that's where all votes are treated equally. Well, yeah, every vote's treated equally, just the person with the least votes wins. I mean, every vote's just as important as everybody's vote's just as important. All candidates are treated equally. Yeah, it's the same rules for both guys. Person who gets the least wins, though. though. Okay, what's a violation is the monotonicity, okay? Person with the least votes wins. So some guy goes back, changes his ballot, and votes for the winner. The winner is going to be like, no, you idiot, I don't want your vote. I want the least amount of votes. Then he might end up not winning, okay? You don't want the vote. So if somebody goes back, changes their ballot, votes you higher up, well, that's going to hurt your cause to get the least amount of votes. You might not have the same winner. Okay, imposed rule is like the chosen one. Okay, it says in a few sentences explain why imposed rule, the voting procedure for two alternatives that is described on page 287, satisfies conditions 1 and 3 on 287, but not 2. Again, you got the chosen one. He's going to win no matter what. I mean, they'll hold an election, but it's all for show. It's like rigged. All votes are technically treated equally. They're all equally worthless. So, yeah, that's satisfied. The candidates aren't treated equally. You might have other candidates, but the election's pretty much rigged. One person's going to win no matter what. The votes are all for show. Even if everyone reverses their vote, the chosen one's still going to win. Condition three is actually satisfied in a weird way. If one person changes their vote in favor of the chosen one, it really doesn't matter. He's going to win anyway. So it doesn't matter if that one person goes back and changes it. It makes absolutely no difference. Dictatorship. Condition one, all votes are not treated equally because in a dictatorship, the only one who votes is the dictator. Condition two is satisfied. All candidates are treated equally in a sense that the dictator, for some strange reason, reverses his vote. He would not win. I know that sounds weird. Okay, If you decide, yeah, I don't want to be in power, I'll vote for somebody else. Yeah, the the election, the change would be reversed, and then the other guy would win. Because his vote's the only one that matters. It's a one-vote system. All voters are not treated equally, yeah. Okay, and then mono, the, yeah, that word, monotonicity. Dictator's a single voter. He alone changes his vote. Then the winner's going to change But because you only have one vote, you're not going to have anybody that goes back and votes for the dictator because he's the only guy who really gets to vote, to be honest with you. 
Okay, number four, I have no idea on that one. Absolutely none how to do that one. Okay, and then you also had to do number 18. In a few sentences explain why Condor Sets rule satisfies the Pareto condition and monotonicity. Remember, the Pareto condition is if Rogers beats Romo on every ballot, Romo cannot win. That's the Pareto condition. Monotonicity means Trump beats Hillary. A voter goes back and votes for Trump, a Hillary voter. Well, that's not going to change the election. Trump's still going to win. Hillary's not going to somehow magically win. Okay? Nobody else. Okay, so here's what we have here on 18. Part A. Condorcet's rule. That's where we matched one-on-one. -on -one, okay? I had like three. It was what we did on problem number nine. If everyone prefers candidate A to B, B can never beat A one-on-one. -on -one, okay? That's why. Condorcet's rule, because it's all about one-to-one -one matchups. Because eventually B's going to run into A, B can't beat him. Monotonicity, if a candidate's already defeated all the other candidates, that's how you win the Condorcet's rule. Okay, A change in his favor only strengthens his cause. He's just become stronger. Uh, he just gains a stronger victory over all the other guys. Okay, remember, Condorcet's rules about those one-to-one -one matchups. Sometimes they don't produce a winner, though. Okay, number 19. In a few sentences, explain why plurality voting, that's the first place vote. Pareto condition. If a candidate's never ahead of another candidate, he gets no first place votes. It's impossible. If all ballots have Rogers ahead of Romo, there's no way Romo gets any first place votes because the priority voting is all about first place votes. It's impossible. Okay, monotonicity. Again, if one person goes back and changes their vote in favor of the winner, the election's not going to change. If only first place matters, if the winner moves up on a ballot, it don't. It only matters if he moves up to first, which would only give him more votes. Because remember, you only track first place. Okay, number 20. In a few sentences, explain why the board account satisfies the Pareto condition. Okay, the board account is on the point system, okay? If every ballot has A ahead of B, B, there's no way he's ever going to get a higher border account than A. There's no way. It's impossible. Okay, monotonicity. A change in favor of the winner only gives him more points. That would strengthen him, and it would weaken his competitors. He'd get more points. His competitors would lose him somewhere. Okay, so that's how monotonicity works. Number 21, in a few sentences, explain why sequential pairing voting satisfies. Remember, that's where we start with A, B opening round, winners moving on to C. Winner of that moves on to D. Okay, that's what sequential pairing is. Okay, why does it satisfy the Condor set winner? Remember, the Condor set is when I pair everybody against everybody. Okay, there's no moving on. You have to face everybody. Okay, and the guy who beats everybody is going to win. Condor set pits a winner versus every other choice one on one. He's going to beat them in sequential pairing, obviously, because it's pretty much the same thing. B, monotonicity. If the winner gets one ballot to move him up, it's going to strengthen him in the one-on-one -on -one contest. He becomes stronger. 22, in a few sentences, explain why the hair system satisfies the Pareto condition. Remember, the hairs, when we start them all off, 
do the plurality voting, then take out the lowest one, then run it again, take out the lowest one, then there ends up being two. Similar to sequential pairing, if candidate A is preferred to candidate B on all ballots, all ballots, B is always going to be behind A. And that causes him, obviously, to be eliminated in sequential pairing before A will be. Okay, and then 23. In a few sentences, explain why the plurality runoff method satisfies the Pareto condition. Two candidates are tied in an election of five people, and the three losers are removed. The candidate who is constantly less favorable has no chance to win the runoff. There's, it's impossible. He's always behind that one candidate. There's always that one guy he can't beat. 